Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily. Then distribute it everywhere and even earn money. All in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. And when you want to take conversations with your fans to the next level, Q&A and polls are the best way to get them talking. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. U.S. Navy History, arriving. Welcome to the U.S. Navy History Podcast. I am Dale, and I'm joined by the XO, Christoph. Hello, Captain Dale. Good to be here. So today I thought we would do something a little bit different, because we have, you know, developing news on a nautical accident. Uh the U.S. Navy it does have a part in it, so I figured let's talk about it. So, are you ready to get underway? Oh, absolutely, yes. So, we're going to be talking about the Titan submersible accident from uh, Ocean Gate is the, the guys who put it into the water. So, a little bit about Ocean Gate real quick. They are a private company. Founded by Stockton Rush and Gulmiro Schlollen back in 2009. Since 2010, it has been transporting customers in commercial submarines that they leased off the coast of California and in the Gulf of Mexico and also in the Atlantic. And they are based out of Everett, Washington. Uh, Rush got it in his head that visiting shipwreck sites was a way to get media attention. So in 2016, they transported customers to a shipwreck for the very first time using their first submersible, Cyclops 1. And they went to the Andrea Doria wreck site. And then in 2019, Rush told the Smithsonian Magazine that there's only one wreck that everybody knows. And if you ask people to name something underwater, it's going to be sharks, whales, and... The Titanic. There you go. Oh, phew. I knew I, I knew I could do it. Yes. Hey, you did very good. So, Titanic. Do you know what Titanic was? It was an unsinkable ship. That was what the designers and builders claimed. It was an unsinkable ship. It was a British ocean liner. And guess what? She sank. What? Hey, 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 wait a minute. I feel bamboozled. Yeah, she sank in the North Atlantic on April 15th, 1912. Do you remember the cause? Uh, well, it was kind of an iceberg. That was the, the impact part, but it was a lot of, a series of poor decisions by people. And design flaws. Yes, but yes, the, the main cause was the collision with the iceberg. So, unfortunately, more than 1,500 people died in that disaster. This was the single deadliest sinking up until that time. She was rediscovered in eight, 1985 by Robert Ballard when he located the Titanic on the ocean floor. About 400 nautical miles from the coast of Newfoundland. And it lies at a depth of about 12,500 feet. So that is very, very, very deep. Oh, yes. So the Titan, 
the whole reason we're talking about this, it was a five person submersible operated by Ocean Gate, had absolutely no seats. Everybody was on their uh, a plank in there. I don't know if you've seen uh, pictures of it. Yeah, pretty bare. Yeah, it's very bare. She was 22 feet long and weighed in at about 23,000 pounds. And she was constructed from carbon fiber and titanium. Not good. The entire pressure vessel contained two titanium hemispheres, two matching titanium interface rings connected by the 56-inch internal diameter. And she had a 7.9-foot carbon fiber-wound cylinder. So let me ask you a question. You said you, you for the listeners at home, work, or on their commute, you shook your head and said, not good. What was not good about the materials you listed, carbon fiber and titanium? Well, carbon fiber and titanium are very, very strong, right? They're also very, very brittle. So when they fail, they fail catastrophically. Yes. I, um, I have a friend who used to work in the cycling uh, engineering business, and they did a lot of things in carbon fiber. And as you say, when it failed, it was completely useless, just completely destroyed, shattered. Yeah. And titanium's the same way. Really? That's surprising to me. That's not something I had heard. So to get uh, to get back to our description of this uh, submersible, one of the titanium hemisphere end caps was fitted with a 15 inch archaic window so you know so they could see outside peekaboo i see fish <laughs> cyclops that makes sense it was one no this is titan tiny eye oh yes never mind i'm not worried about cyclops according to greek mythology though cyclops was a titan so technically i'm still Ooh. right Ooh, we're getting into Continue. that uh, we're getting into that uh that old stuff. I like to go old school, but I'm sorry. I didn't mean to keep interrupting you. Continue. Let's hear oh, more about Titan. No And their tiny window. So in 2020, about three years ago, Rush said that the hull was originally designed to reach 4,000 meters below sea level. And it had been downgraded after that to about a rating of 3,000 meters, which is about 9,800 feet. So after, because they found some signs of cyclic fatigue. Mm. So in 2020, 2021, they either repaired or rebuilt the hull. We don't know. And Rush told the Traveler Weekly that the carbon fiber had been sourced at a discount from Boeing. Because it was too old for them to use in planes. Oh, that's... That's a bad, hmm. Yeah. If the airlines don't want to use it, why are you going to use it in a submersible that's supposed to take the pressures of the ocean? Well, what kind of, hold on. What kind of discount are we talking? No idea. <laughs> uh, yeah. There's no answer that is sufficient enough. That's a dumb idea. Yeah. Now, on... Whether it's true or not, we're not exactly sure, though, because Boeing said they have no records of any sale to Rush or to Oceangate. But, of course, they could be CYOA. Mm-hmm. So, Titan is, was, sorry, Titan was able to move uh, at a maximum speed of three knots using four electric thrusters, and they were arrayed two horizontal and two vertical. <laughs> that is remarkably slow. I mean, based on the conversations we've had, torpedoes travel much fa faster than that currently. Yes. They were also smaller and more streamlined and weren't... Going thousands we're, of feet down. Right. Go, we're doing that. And they weren't worried about keeping humans comfortable. That's true. Matter of fact, their mission was to make humans as, mu as uncomfortable as possible. Hmm. Okay, I can see that. So, the Titan's helm. This was a Logitech F 
710 wireless game controller with modified analog sticks. I saw the video that contained this controller, and that seems like a terrible interface. Those I if you for those of you out there who have been a gamer for a sustained period of time, uh, those things fail and fail catastrophically, and then that's it. You cannot play your game, which could be mildly frustrating. But when you're controlling a submersible craft hundreds to thousands of feet below the surface of the water, that seems like a bad time to rely on that technology. Well, they did have two backups. Better, yeah, okay. But, yeah, it just does not... It does not seem like a first-class operation, I'll say that. Well, here's the thing, though. These type of controllers are getting more and more common in use in things that need more than, you know, one axis to be able to control. Hmm. They're, they're starting to be more and more used. Even back in the early aughts, they were using, like, old Xbox controllers on hmm. uh, on bomb disposal drones in uh, Afghanistan. I did not know that. That's interesting. Now, they actually found the controller on the bottom. It survived. That is some seriously well well done engineering. Good on you, Logitech. Yeah. So in in 2023, OceanGate claimed that the Titan was designed and engineered by OceanGate Inc. in collaboration with experts from NASA, Boeing, and the University of Washington. A one-third scale model of the Cyclops II pressure vessel was built and tested at the Applied Physics Laboratory at uh, U of W. And the model was able to sustain a pressure of 4,285 PSI, which corresponded to a depth of about 9,800 feet. After the Titan disappeared, University of Washington and... and uh, APL claimed no involvement in design, engineering, or testing of the Titan submersible. Ooh. Uh, we are in a very litigious society, it sounds like. And then Boeing came out and said, Boeing was not a partner on the Titan and did not design or build it. Mm. And then NASA came out and they were like, they did have a Space Act agreement with Ocean Gate but did not conduct testing and manufacturing via its workforce or effects or facilities. So, yeah, but that just means they didn't build it. Right. If I'm hearing that right. So they could have helped design it and done all the mathematics behind or material selection, all, all that stuff. That's a very interesting statement. Well, as they investigate, we'll, we might learn more. I agree. It's not wise to jump to conclusions so early. Right. But it is, that is just a point of note that is interesting to me. Oh, suffice to say, now that you said that, uh, this is a developing story and this is all the information we have up until this recording. Things in the future can and probably will change. Mm -hmm. So OceanGate said that the vessel contained monitoring systems to continuously monitor the strength of the hull. And the vessel had life support for five people for 96 hours. Wow. However, they did not install GPS. The support ship that they had was to monitor the position of the Titan relative to its target, where it was wanting to go. And they used text messages to give them distances and directions. That, that doesn't seem like a really good idea, because you're no. relying on towers that are far away i mean how... they were relying on elon musk's starlink system starlink okay well I, that actually brings up a question that i had when you said there was no gps the gps is fine and all but does it traverse can it penetrate uh ten thousand feet of ocean water like are those signals you have to amplify them quite a bit for them to be that to get through that medium i would imagine i'm sure there's something because military subs, I'm sure, would have some kind of tracking technology, but they're not they're not going that deep either. I think they're what, like three to five thousand feet below, supposedly. That is classified. Yes. 
and I have no relation to any military, so my word is not like a secret. Oh, he's revealed it. <laughs> so water absorbs electromagnetic radiation, which is why sonar and tech using sound waves is necessary. Yeah. That's why GPS and radar are not able to be used underwater. Right. It's great for the surface of the Earth. Oh, yeah, air is great. But, but water is a different beast. So why the heck are you relying on text messages, which I would think would be a weaker form of that? I don't know. That seems like uh, put this in the other in the in the bad decision category. Very bad decision. If there is a listener out there that can clarify why this is not a bad decision, or uh, you know, provide some details, right? Like maybe Starlink is that awesome, or water's not that big of a deal. You know, just join our Discord and let us know. Yes, absolutely. Uh, okay. So, according to Ocean Gate, the Titan had seven backup systems intended to return it to the surface in case of an emergency. They had ballasts that could be dropped. There was a balloon that could be inflated. And there are thrusters. And some of these backup systems were designed to work even if everybody on board the submersible was incapacitated. Like, they had sandbags that could be dropped by hooks that dissolved after a certain number of hours in the salt water. That's cool. So, you know, if it worked, which we'll never know because that's not what caused it, but right. then the sandbags would be released and the vessel would float to the surface. Uh, a investigator from Ocean Gate said that if the vessel did not automatically ascend after the elapsed time, those of the people that were inside could actually release the ballast by either tilting the ship back and forth to dislodge it, so running to the fore, to the aft, to the fore, to the aft, or crawling, because there's not much room in there. Hmm? But they also had a pneumatic pump that they could loosen the weights with. Yep. Well, both of those in involve consciousness, right? And... A lot of this is just hope and prayer, man. Yeah. That's... I, I'm i very conflicted. Let me take a moment and say I'm conflicted about this story because I do admire people that will go into what looks like an absolute death trap and risk their lives to do something amazing. I think that's great, generally. Uh, that said, this looked very foolish and there were lots of what I would consider red flags, or maybe just I have the perspective of all these investigative journalists popping up with information after the fact that may have been concealed uh, to the customers. But uh, this, this is a bad idea. Yeah. Danger comes with exploration and doing something people have never done before. Right. Or very few have done before. But there's a difference between doing it intelligently and doing it, well, in this case, the billionaire way. So stupidly. Well, I don't know if... So I think about like, uh, what is it? Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos both launched rockets somewhat recently and they were able to return to Earth and it wasn't like a spectacular... They went to space and it wasn't super spectacular, but it was safe. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. they were able to invest the money, and they, they had all these... They could do it repeatedly, like William Shatner went up there, and... Well, they also did it unmanned many, 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 yes. many, many times. They put the work and the testing in. Mm -hmm. They didn't just take a tin can, put throw people in it, and say, good luck. Now, it seems you mentioned the Andrea Doria earlier. Like, they went to go check out that uh, wreckage site. And I think that that's like in the hundreds of feet. It's not very deep. And it's an or literally an order of magnitude or to get from that to Titanic. And so just because it works on one very shallow, relatively shallow wreckage, I don't know. This just, it's got my spidey sense tingling all over the place. Right. She lies in 160 feet. So that's what, like five atmospheres worth of pressure? versus 
I don't know, I haven't done the math on the Titanic, but I'm guessing 300 or so. But also when they were going to that site, they were you they were renting a submersible. They weren't using their own yet. Oh, okay. Well, that's a different story. So they designed Hmm, okay. Later they used their own Cyclops 1, but at when they first started they leased commercial submersibles. Well, I could see that then, because commercial submersibles could reach the 160 feet depth, and they would have to design something more robust to get down to Titanic depth. Yeah. Okay. So Titan made its first dive to the Titanic in July of 2020, and they actually had a total of six dives to the Titanic in 21. Wow. And then seven in 22. These dives typically had a pilot, a guide, and three paying passengers. Once inside, they would bolt the latch shut from the outside. and could only be reopened from the outside. There's a safety red flag right there. Yeah, that's when I saw that, I was... I mean, I'm not that claustrophobic, but good grief. At least give me... Give me some way to open it. So the descent to the surface uh, uh, and to the Titanic typically took about two hours. The full dive was about eight hours. And throughout the dive, the submersible sent a safety ping every 15 minutes that the crew that was on the mothership above them monitored. And they also had text message capability. Short ones, but they did have it. Okay. Well, I mean, knowing that there were, what what did you say, 13 successful dives in 21 and 22, that that lends some credence to its ability to actually do it. Yeah, but remember, they they found those... uh, Yeah, the fatigue, the cyclical fatigue. fatigue. Yeah. Right. And they either repaired it or you know, replaced it, which we don't know which. At least that's what they claim. Right. So the the company decided they were going to make their uh, customers, you know, feel even more special by referring to them as mission specialists. Mm-hmm. So you pay $250,000, you get to be a mission specialist for eight days. Well, that's that's pretty cool. I guess. <laughs> you know... Uh, for just a couple of hundred dollars, you can go down to a trophy store. You could buy your own trophy and call yourself whatever you want. Yeah. Not that I've done that. I just want to be clear. So I've not done that several times. Well, then you need to move that off of the shelf behind you and hide it. Oh, shoot. Hold on. So the Titan was expected to make multiple dives this year, but she was destroyed on her first dive for the year. So let's get into the safety concerns. So she operated in international water, so she did not carry passengers from port to port, which means she is not subject to safety regulations. That's another red flag. She was not certified as seaworthy by any regulatory agency or third-party organization. Red flag. Yeah. The There was a guy named David Porg, Porge, who was a reporter, and he went on the expedition in 22 as part of a CBS News Sunday morning feature. He said that all the passengers who entered the Titan had to sign a waiver confirming that their knowledge that it is a experimental vessel and that it has not been approved or certified by any regulatory body and that it could result in physical injury, disability, emotional trauma, or death. Well, they weren't wrong. The television producer who also went on that voyage, named a guy named Mike Race, he said that the waiver mentioned death three times on page one. Yeah. The Smithsonian Magazine in 2019 referred to Rush as a daredevil inventor. Red flags everywhere. I'll say, yes. 
they describe Rush as having the having said that the U.S. Passenger Vessel Safety Act of 1993 needlessly prioritized passenger safety over commercial innovation. So, thinking back to the age of exploration, where people went into the great unknown with and may have been lost at sea, like that was cause of death, lost at sea. Um, we don't really see that as much anymore because of the things you're talking about. The, the, the industry itself can self-regulate, and then we also have governmental agencies that do that. But in any event, there are people that can say, yeah, this works, and it's not a big deal. And then people that try to skirt that, what kind of innovation are you trying to do that requires people, like we have robots now, if you want to innovate, innovate and put some robots on there and it's a win-win. Nobody dies. Remote underwater ROVs have been around since mid-80s. Yeah. At, 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 at least. Yeah, no, it's... Uh, anyway. <laughs> he said in a 2002 interview that, quote, at some point, safety is just pure waste. I mean, if you just want to be safe, don't get out of bed. Don't get in your car. Don't do anything. Uh, in a different interview, he said, quote, I've broken some rules to make Titan. I think I've broken them with logic and good engineering behind me. The carbon fiber and titanium, there's a rule. You don't do that. Well, I did. Yep. I, I just keep thinking the applications I've seen carbon fiber in do not include something with external pressure. I think, like in an airplane, you have internal pressure. You know what I mean? Mm hmm So it's much lighter pressure outside and greater pressure in the fuselage. And that seems like it would work okay. But especially with the, the cyclical nature of going all the way down, having that external pressure coming back up and then having it released and back and forth, that seems like a terrible idea. Well, he did have a thing that he invented called the RTM, okay. which was an integrated real-time health monitoring system. This was patented by him, and it employed acoustic sensors and strain gauges at the pressure boundary to analyze the effects of increasing pressure as the Titan ventured deeper and deeper and deeper into the ocean to monitor the hull's integrity in real time. Supposedly, this would give them early warning of problems and allow them to abort and go back Ascend? up to the surface. Yeah. Obviously, that did not work. I think, well, it goes back to what you said earlier at the podcast as far as when you have a failure with those materials, it's catastrophic. And an early warning may be, what, like seconds? Depends on what the thresholds are. Right. And that's entirely set by humans. I also want to address the the safety comment that he had. And there is a thing called risk assessment. And there are things that are safer and things that are more dangerous. And you could still do something more dangerous and have it be within the bounds of safe enough. And to say, to use a zero tolerance policy of I will not accept any lack of safety is, uh, it's a, I forgot what the term is, uh, acceptable level of risk no that it's a logical like when you try to make a logical argument but a fallacy it's a logical fallacy to say well if you know you don't want to be unsafe don't get out of bed it's like that's not what we're saying no you're trying to substitute features of an argument to to make your case there is acceptable risk and you can use your brain and assess the nuance of the situation and understand that yeah maybe that's Maybe there are some things here that should be considered. Well, remember, there's test pilots, right? That's a whole thing, testing new aircraft. But they got to right. get the aircraft to a certain threshold before they'll put a human in that cockpit. Right. But it's still a very dangerous experimental job. Absolutely, yes. So. <sighs> uh, one last thing. I've not made any experimental vehicles, so maybe uh, I'm speaking out of ignorance or uh, bluster or... Like I know better, but I, I have a family that I would assess risks for, even with commercial vehicles, 
and say, yeah, maybe don't get in that, or maybe don't stay behind that car or something, because it does, it seems less safe. Yeah, that's exactly why when I got my new van, instead of giving my teenage son my old car, I assessed that I don't want him driving that because it is not safe enough. Right. So I sold it to somebody else who gave it to their teenager because they made a completely different decision. Yeah. Maybe it was the uh, Ocean Gate CEO's son that drove your van. It's like, hey, safety, who cares? So uh, the director of marine operations for Ocean Gate, a guy named David Lockridge, he put together a report documenting safety concerns he had about the Titan. He urged the company to have Titan assessed and certified by a agency, but Ocean Gate had said, we don't want to pay them to do that. He also said that the viewport on the, on the forward part was only certified to reach a depth of 4,300 feet. No. Which is only a third of the depth required to reach the Titanic. Yeah, that's... Mm, okay. He was also concerned that Ocean Gate would not perform non-destructive testing on the vessel's hull before undertaking manned dives. In other words, they didn't want to build another one just to see how far... It would go before it got crushed. I, yeah, I understand that. The, it sounds expensive. I'm like, it didn't look like a whole lot on the video as far as nice features or seats and things like that. But the materials alone and the labor to put that together so precisely is expensive. And I do understand not wanting to throw that away. But it's an investment. Like to, if it's experimental, you want to experiment on it to make sure you can make it viable for the future. Yep. He was also told that he could not get a scan of the hull to or the bond line to check for deliminations or voids or anything to you know to to make sure that everything's going right. And he said he, they were, he was told it's because of the thickness of the hull. You can't do a scan because the hull's too thick? That's what they said. Well, they have dials on those scanners. Like, they can adjust stuff. Uh, or so I assume. Maybe I am also ignorant of the scanning industry. Ocean Gate, they, they said that, well, Lockridge, he's not an engineer. So he, he refused to accept safety approvals from the engineering team but our evaluation is that the hull was stronger than any kind of third pay party evaluation that Lockridge thought was necessary hmm yeah well um Ali that it's, this is making me more frustrated I guess as I hear more about this story so Oshigate sues him for making the quote fraudulent statements and breaking his confidentiality contract is NDR mm -hmm. and Lockridge countersued stating that he'd been wrongfully terminated as a whistleblower for you know bringing up his concerns of the Titans safety and everything ended in the settlement I imagine yeah when you mentioned there were safety recommendations from the engineering team that team must right now feel pretty miserable you know it's like I told them and told them and told them these were the concerns, these were the possible uh, points of failure, and then this happens, and it's, uh, that's got to feel terrible. I remember, this is 2018, too, so this is early on. Uh, in the same year, the Marine Te Technological Society wrote a letter to Rush, and they expressed their unanimous concern regarding the development of Titan and the planned expedition to the Titanic. They said that the current experimental approach could result in negative outcomes from minor to catastrophic. And it would actually have serious consequences for everybody in the industry. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm sure if you were to ask your average citizen 
would you like to travel in a submersible vehicle? Their answer today is much different than it would have been a year ago. Yeah. Because of this. Rush, you know, responded by saying that he believed industry standards were stifling innovation. A guy named Rob McCullum, who was who is a leading deep sea exploration specialist, he contacted Rush and he said, quote, I implore you to take every care in your testing and sea trials to be very, very conservative. And Rush replied back, quote, that he's tired of industry players who try to use safety arguments to stop innovation. We have heard the basis, baseless cries of, you are going to kill someone way too often. I take this as a serious personal insult. To which McCullum replies, I think you are potentially placing yourself and your clients in a dangerous dynamic. In your race to Titanic, you are mirroring that famous catch cry. Quote, she is unsinkable. Yeah, I, that is a bit ironic. The, the blind hubris of a person can override the safety concerns of so many just because they, they want to get, make a name for themselves. Yeah, and at that point, OceanGate sent their lawyers to McClellan and threatened to sue him. I'm for innovation, and I, I sometimes think, sometimes, that when you have restrictions, like, um, like he's talking about that stifle innovation, that can produce new innovation, like uh, the engine efficiencies from the 1970s to now are in large part because they had to figure something out based on uh, some of the new restrictions that were put in place. And so, yes, they can be more expensive, and yes, they can be harder to deal with at the beginning, but it can foster innovation because you have to deal with it. And besides, when you're beginning something, it is going to be more expensive. It's going to be astronomically right. expensive. And as development goes on, that's when it gets cheaper and cheaper and Right. That's just the way it works. So have you ever heard of a guy named Ross Kemp? Ross Kemp. I don't believe so. Well, he's a British actor. And uh, last year he was going to do a uh, documentary because, you know, the British like their docky walkies. Mm -hmm. And they were this was to mark the 110th anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic. And so he was going to actually dive to Titanic on the Titan. And the BBC was like, no, we're shelving this because the submersible is deemed to be unsafe and not fit for purpose. So the wow. TV station doesn't even want to have anything to do with it. Well, the British have a pretty strong naval history. Perhaps uh, it's infused every element of their society, including their media companies. Yeah. So there were a couple of incidents prior to, you know, the, uh, the, the accident. In uh, 2022, uh, a reporter, again, David Progue, he was on board the mothership when Titan became lost and could not locate the Titanic during a time. He questioned the Titan safety, which went viral on social media, after, you know, Titan lost contact with the mothership in June of 2023. So it's lost contact twice so far. In that report, Rush commented, or he commented to Rush that, quote, it seems like this submersible has some elements of MacGyvery, jury rigness. He noted that a $30 Logitech F. 710 wireless game controller with modified control sticks was used to steer and pitch this the sub and that the construction pipes were used as ballast yeah that, yeah that's i don't know like I, I mean again to logitech's credit they were able to find an intact controller in the wreckage that might have still... been one of the ones that was uh, a backup and it was stored oh, in one of the cones that's true so in another dive in 22 one of the thrusters on Titan was actually installed backwards. Ooh. And so Titan started spinning in circles when trying to move forward near the sea floor. The, they, they fixed the issue by holding the game controller sideways. Well, that 
is some creative problem solving, but not golly, if I was on board, it's like I paid two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for this. Going in circles on the seafloor? Although how many people can say they've done that? No, yeah, that's true. Well, I guess it depends where you consider the sea starting. Because I've been in the sea, but, you know, up to my waist. Mm. So in November, there were court filings. Apparently, OceanGate reported that in a 2022 dive, this submersible suffered battery issues and had to be manually attached to a lifting platform and that this caused damage to external components. So, it's not been entirely a smooth ride. Come on, Dale. If you want to be safe, just stay in bed. Okay. Yeah, but my computer's not in my bed, and that means I can't put the show out anymore. Oh, shoot. You need to move your uh, computer to your bed, sounds like. Hmm. Or we can add the descriptor dangerous to this podcast. Or unsafe, either way. I'm going to, I'm not going to do that. Okay, okay. <laughs> that, I, you are the captain. All right, so let's get into the uh, accident itself. So the voyage was booked in early this year, and Rush approached a Las Vegas businessman, Jane Bloom, with two discounted tickets because he wanted his son to be on the trip. For, 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 for Jay and his son to be on the trip. So the billionaire, so Rush, he offered $150,000 per seat, which is $100,000 off the regular price of $250,000. And Rush told him that it was safer than crossing the street. Bloom, he was a bit smarter than Rush because he was like, mm, I got safety concerns on this. So this trip was scheduled for May, but it got delayed till June because of weather. So they start preparing in June 16th to 17th, and they departed from St. John's, Newfoundland, aboard the research and expedition ship MV Polar Prince. The ship arrived at the dive site on the 17th, and a guy named Hamish Harding, he posted on Facebook, quote, due to the worst winter in Newfoundland in 40 years, this mission is likely to be the first and only crewed mission to the Titanic in 2023. A weather window has just opened up and we are going to attempt a dive tomorrow. And there is going to have a starting time of 0400. Whoa. So the dive operation began on June 18th at 0930. A little bit uh, later than 0400. And for the first hour and a half of the descent, she communicated with the Polar Prince every 15 minutes as she was supposed to. But communication stopped after a recorded communication at 11.15. Titan was expected to resurface at 16.30, but of course failed to do so. So at 19.10, the U.S. Coast Guard was notified titan's disappearance uh, as we stated earlier she had a titan had 96 hours of breathable air for five people and that means that it would expire on the morning of june 22nd if you know titan had remained whole a u.s navy acoustic detection system which is designed to locate military submarines they detected an acoustic signature that consisted of a implosion hours after Titan submerged. This information was discovered after the submarine was reported missing, which caused the Navy to review its acoustic data from that time period, and they passed it to Coast Guard. So between June 18th to June 22nd, that's when the search and rescue efforts were in effect. They consisted of the United States Coast Guard, the United States Navy, the Canadian Coast Guard, and these guys led the search and rescue efforts. Aircraft from the Royal Canadian Air Force and the United States Air National Guard, a Royal Navy or a Royal Canadian Navy ship, and several commercial and research ships, and also ROVs, remotely operated vehicles, assist all assist assisted in the search. 
Uh, the search also involved both surface search and sonar search. Uh, crews from the northeast sector of the United States Coast Guard in Boston launched search missions 900 nautical miles from the shore of Cape Cod, which is in Massachusetts, and the Joint Rescue Coordination Center in Halifax, which is in Canada, reported that a Royal Canadian Air Force Lockheed CP Tech 140 Aurora aircraft and a CCGS Copit Hobson 1752 were also participating in the search in response to, you know, assistant requests from the Maritime Rescue Coordination Center in Boston. The next day, this was all on the 18th. On the 19th, there were three C-130 Hercules aircraft, two from the United States and one from Canada, a P-8 Poseidon anti-submarine warfare aircraft from the United States, and a number of sonar bu buoys. Unfortunately, search and rescue was hampered by low visibility and weather conditions. Uh, the Coast Guard, the U.S. Coast Guard, said that the search and rescue mission was very hard because of the remote location, the weather, the darkness, the sea conditions, and the water temperature. So remember, this water is cold. Rear Admiral John McGuire said that they were quote, deploying all available assets. Now, a lot of submersibles are equipped with acoustic beacons, which emit sounds that can be detected underwater by rescuers. Guess what Rush didn't get? I'm guessing he didn't get that early acoustic data from the Navy? Or the acoustic beacon. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah, that... Uh... So, a pipe-laying ship, the Deep Energy, arrived on site on the 20th and they had two ROVs and other you know equipment suited to the seabed depth in the area at this time the U.S. Coast Guard had actually searched 10,000 square miles on the surface but the and then the New York Air National Guard's 106 rescue wing joins in the search using the HC-130J and then they plan to have two more join them by the end of the day. Now, at this time, the a Canadian CP-140 Aurora, their sonar picked up underwater noises. I believe this is the knocking that everybody had been talking about. Yes, that was confusing because it seemed like there was hope. They heard knocking, and then a, days later, oh no... It had imploded much earlier, and so that was very confusing after the fact. Yeah. The Coast Guard officially acknowledged, the U.S. Coast Guard officially acknowledged this sounds early the next morning, but reported that, uh, you know, investigations had not yielded any results. Uh, Rear Admiral John McGuire of the U.S. Coast Guard said the source of the noise was unknown and may have come from the many metal objects at the site of the wreck. Remember, there's a huge metal ocean liner down there. Yes, that's true. There could be things knocking into it as we speak. Uh, a Canadian CP-140 Aurora reported spotting a white rectangular object floating on the surface, and then a ship was sent to identify the object and got diverted to help find the source of the noise. And then the U.S. Coast Guard later describes it unrelated, unrelating to the missing vessel, which we all know now that's completely 100% true. Yeah. So that brings us to the 21st, the CCGS John Cabat, which is a United States Coast Guard ship, arrives, and they bring in more sonar capabilities to the search effort. A couple of commercial vessels, the Scanadi Vinland and the Atlantic Merlin, also arrive, and a, another C-130 crew also got there. So. About at, at about 1,500, five air and water crews were actively searching for a Titan. And another five were expected to arrive within the next 24 to 48 hours. I am very impressed with that operational efficiency and just the coordination involved in trying to get that all that uh, material and all the aircraft and ships together and searching and 
communicating, and that that really is a testament to their ability to operate. That's the uh, the military for you. Oh Mar yes, the Marine Time military. Uh, so these assets included two ROVs, a CP one forty Aurora, and a C one thirty. The U.S. Navy's flyaway deep ocean salvage system, which is designed to lift large and heavy objects from the sea floor, arrived in St. John's that day. Unfortunately, there were no ships available to carry this system to the wreck site. Uh, officials would estimate that it would take around 24 hours to install it to the deck of a carrier ship before it could be taken to the search and rescue area of operations. Wow. It's a lot of setup. It's not your uh, regular Ikea desk. Yeah. So even though there were concerns at this time now about the air supply on the Titan, the a U.S. Coast Guard spokesperson said at a press conference that, quote, this is a search and rescue mission, 100%, rather than a wreckage recovery mission. At uh, this point now, a Odyssey 6K ROV from the... Per Logic Research Services, which was traveling aboard a Canadian tug, the MV Horizon Arctic reached the sea floor and began searching for Titan. A French ROV from the ship, oh, I'm going to butcher this, La Atalanti deployed the Victor 6000 which can reach depths of up to 20,000 feet while also transmitting its images to the surface. Wow, that's really cool. So this brings us to the 22nd. So at 1318, the U.S. Coast Guard announced that a debris field had been found near the Titanic. It was actually located by the Odysseus 6K ROV five hours after it started its search and was confirmed to be a part of the submersible. The Coast Guard said that the loss of the submarine was due to an implosion of the pressure chamber and that pieces of the Titan had been found on the seafloor about 1,600 feet from the bow of the Titanic. So close. The debris consisted of the tail cone and the forward and aft end bells. The tail cone is not part of the pressure vessel, but the forward and aft bells are. They're actually intended to protect the crew from the ocean environment. Uh, according to the Coast Guard, the debris field was con concentrated in two areas, with the aft end bell laying separately from the front end bell and the tail cone, which would coincide with a catastrophic implosion. As a matter of fact, Rear Admiral John McGuire of the U.S. Coast Guard said that it was consistent with a catastrophic loss of the pressure chamber, which he said it a little bit more fluidly than I did, but... Well, he probably gets to say that more often than you do. Right. Well, I hope not. Well, you... Yes. <laughs> I hope not either. It's not my desire that he has to say that often, but at the same time, you don't usually get to say that, I'm sure, in your everyday life. No. Now, when he was asked whether they were going to be able to recover the bodies, he stated that he did not know, but he did say that it was, quote, an incredibly unforgiving environment. That's so sad. Like this whole... <laughs> it's sad. So on the 23rd, the logic research services confirmed that a new mission to the debris field was already underway and that it had taken their drone an hour to reach the site to continue searching and documenting debris it also said that the debris from titan was too heavy for the rov rov to lift and that any recovery would have to take place at a later stage on the 24th the polar prince returned to st john's harbor and investigators boarded the ship because they're going to have to start investigating. Yep. So the five people that lost their lives was Shahzanda Dawood. He was 48 years old. He was a Pakistani British businessman of the 
Dawood Hercule. He was one of the wealthiest people in Pakistan. Also, his son, Solomon Dawood, he was a student at the University of Strathside. He was 19 years old. According to his aunt, he was terrified of going on the trip, but he wanted to please his father, and that's why he went. Also on board was Hamish Harding. He was 58, a British businessman, aviator, and space tourist. He had actually previously descended into the Mariana Trench and broken the Guinness World Record for the fastest circulum navigation of the Earth. Wow. And he flew into space in 2022 on a Blue Origins rocket. Also on board was Paul Henry Nargolut. He was 77. He was a former French Navy commander, diver, submersible pilot, and member of the French Institute for Research and Exploration of the Sea. And he was the director of underwater research for EM Group and RMS Titanic, Inc., who owns the salvage rights to Titanic. He has led more than 35 expeditions to the wreck and supervised the recovery of thousands of artifacts and was widely considered the leading authority on the wreckage site. Wow. And the last one was, of course, Stockton Rush. He was 61. He was a American submersible pilot, chief, or he was an engineer and businessman and the CEO and co-founder of Ocean Gate. So... Both Canada and the U.S. has announced that they are launching investigations into the incident, which is not surprising. The United States investigation will involve the National Transportation Board of Safety and the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard will take the lead because it has declared the incident a major marine casualty, which makes sense because it is a marine casualty. The Canadian Transportation Safety Board announced that it has launched an investigation into the incident as Titan support vessel vessel MV Polar Prince is flagged as Canadian. So this is where the investigators headed to Newfoundland and where they got onto the Polar Prince and started their investigation. The RCMP also announced that they were performing a preliminary examination of the incident to determine whether to launch a full investigation. I don't know why the Royal Canadian Mounted Police has anything to do with this, but go Canada. Yeah. <laughs> I think they're kind of, they have a reputation like uh, maybe the FBI or the Texas Rangers. It's just kind of like, hey, call in the experts and then it's them. Yeah. So that is all the information we have up until us recording this. And I'm sure that there will be more information coming out as the investigations are concluded and we will learn more. So what I can say about that is we will update everybody as it goes along. So I believe that we are going to end today's episode here. Thank you guys for joining us for today's peek into a, into this, this this accident so christoph would you please take us out uh certainly so yeah like uh dale said thank you so much for listening uh if you would like to contact the podcast feel free to email us at usa navy history podcast at gmail.com uh we are also on twitter at usn as in navy history pod and then like i mentioned previously in the episode we have a discord channel which you can find in the show notes uh please contact us this is um hopefully a way for us to foster a two-way communication we'd love to hear from you thank you and there's no a in that email address it's us navy history podcast at gmail.com yes i i hope i didn't misspeak (laughs) you did that's why i'm correcting well thank you us (laughs) navy history podcast at gmail.com. And with that, we're going to wish you guys a fair winds and following seat. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. U.S. Naval History Podcast. Departing. Departing.